Hello, Warriors. This is Jody with Warriors Rise, and we are back with Mary Nell Wyatt Lee. And uh, welcome back, Mary Nell. I, Thank you. I am glad to be back. I am happy to have you. I have had the most wonderful response to the first video we did. Now, this will be part two of mm -hmm. Noah's Ark, and we have so many other adventures that, uh, scheduled ahead, so it's exciting. So I just want to um, let everyone know that this is the second part. So if you missed the first part, you may want to go back and watch that first um, about Ron and his discovery of Noah's Ark. And then this pick up here because this is going to be very, I believe this will have more of the technical. And this will cover all of the evidence. Yes. Excellent. This is exciting. So let's just invite the Lord and, uh, and then we'll get started. Father, in your glorious and mighty name, we praise you and we welcome you here today on this show. I thank you for Mary Nell, Lord God. I pray an anointing upon her, Father, that as she reveals those things which were once hidden that you are now bringing forward, that your anointing will be upon her, Father, and that her words will speak in power and in truth. I thank you, Father, for being with us this day. You are glorious. You are mighty. We love you more than breath, Lord God. In Jesus Christ's mighty and precious name, amen. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. So welcome again. And uh, I just want to go ahead and, and let you um, start to maybe recap a little bit of before, and then you can start um, with where you are now. Okay. Um, today, we're going to cover the evidence for Noah's Ark, but we are going to go through it in a uh, methodical you know so you kind of know when things happened and all right. and ron's first trip to noah's ark was in 77. his second trip was in 79 but then he didn't go back until 1984 wow. and there was a reason for that um it, in between the reason it took him five years is because he had other projects going on, which we'll cover in later programs. Right. But uh, that was when he went to the Red Sea crossing, found it. That's when he started work on uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And he actually found the Ark before he ever went back to Noah's Ark. Right. And it's kind of interesting when you think about, um, you know, the, the chronology of everything. Right. So Ron continued to study to try to understand the state of the remains he believed to be Noah's Ark. And he didn't want to return until he had some idea of how to proceed. He saw the Sutton Ho ship. He saw, he read about this, an ancient Anglo-Saxon ship built in Suffolk, England back in maybe the, I don't know, the sixth century or something. Mm. And he believed that possibly this could explain the state of the remains and therefore not much would be found as far as wood or structure, but perhaps some metal. Although practically none of the original timber survived in the Sutton home, the form of the ship was perfectly preserved. Wow. Stains of the sand had uh, replaced the wood, but had preserved many construction details. Nearly all of the iron planking rivets were in their original places, and it was possible to survey the original ship. Wow. So this gave Ron an idea. He, it led him to the thought that if this site were similar to the Sutton Hole funeral boat, there might still be some metal in the fittings of the ship. So he wrote to White's Electronics, explained what he was doing, and asked if they would possibly provide him with a metal detector. Wow. He just didn't have any money. You know, he saved everything he could to, to go to these places. And they responded by sending him two of their latest models, one being a deep probe type that would search deeper than others. Wow. In 1983, before he returned, he drove out to Colorado and met Colonel Jim Irwin, whom he had learned was looking for Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat. Colonel Irwin had served as Apollo Lunar Module Pilot for Apollo 15, wow. the fourth human lunar landing. He was the eighth person to walk on the moon and the first and youngest of those astronauts, unfortunately, to die. Ron wanted to show Jim the site. And so they agreed to fly out together in August of 1984 with the metal detectors. Mm. 
Now, Ron still didn't have a video camera and only had his simple eight millimeter camera, which captured no sound. Mm. And this is the only footage that he has of the first metal detector scans. And I believe this is Colonel Irwin's helicopter pilot operating the device, but it, this really doesn't tell us anything. Mm. But Ron did scans and he began to carefully note the pattern of the readings that he got. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, there's a distinct pattern. Mm -hmm. Looking at it this way, he got the patterns on, uh, this is the lower end, and he got the patterns on both the, looking this way on the left side and then the lower right side. Mm -hmm. Now, Colonel Irwin was the greatest blessing that ever happened to Ron, because he introduced him to people in Istanbul and Ankara, and who helped him. And one of those, uh, Orhan was his name, became Ron's liaison and translator. With his new liaison, he was able to go to the location he believed the art originally came to rest and actually spend time there. While searching the area, he found what he believed was a 120 foot section of petrified wood buried in the earth. Mm -hmm. All around it were strange looking rocks. I mean, he knew something was, something had happened there. So he picked up some and one in particular, he gave to Colonel Irwin and asked him if he could get it analyzed because he knew Colonel Irwin had a lot of connections. And this is that specimen right here. Colonel Irwin asked a physicist at Los Alamos National Labs to do an analysis. Well, the startling results of that analysis captured the attention of the man doing the analysis, Dr. John Baumgartner. This had both titanium and aluminum, among other metals. We have only been able to alloy aluminum and titanium since the early 20th century. Wow. Now, this led Dr. Baumgartner to suggest to one of his fellow scientists that perhaps a missile had crashed out there and Ron thought it was the remains of Noah's Ark. Mm. Well, Ron was very excited by this result. It was the impetus he needed to continue studying the site. Mm. It proved to him that the site near the top of the ridge was almost certainly the original landing site. And from this point on, things began to happen quickly. Dr. Baumgartner made plans to join the research in 1985. Another researcher, David Tassel, had contacted Colonel Irwin about searching for the art in the lava flows at the foot of Mount Ararat, mm -hmm. because he also, just like Ron, didn't believe the art could be on the volcanic mountain. Mm -hmm. And he referred, uh, Colonel Irwin referred Mr. Fassel to Ron, and both men, Dr. Baumgartner and David Fassel, came in 1985 to join work on the project. Wow. Now, Ron by now knew that the site was full of petrified wood. Mm -hmm. He had found specimens, which he brought home to test and some still in place on the site. This meant he had to understand how a ship had become petrified or fossilized on a mountainside mm -hmm. at 6,250 feet above sea level. So he studied both volcanoes and petrification. He actually lived in Hawaii for four years before he moved back to Tennessee. Wow. And he, he knew that ever since Darwin came up with his theory of evolution and claims were made that the earth was millions of years old, that people were taught that it took millions of years for objects to petrify. Mm. And he knew that if the earth was, as the Bible revealed, just about 6,000 years old, mm -hmm. that petr petrification took place quickly. Now, Ron concluded that at some time, lava had flowed down the mountainside from the top of the mountain, carrying the ship with it. When the ship struck the large outcropping of limestone, it was impaled and held fast. The weight of the lava then piled on top of the ship and it collapsed at least 
the top deck and soon the entire ship was encapsulated within the hardening lava, which protected it, cutting it off from oxygen. But the question is, why didn't the lava burn the ship up? Hmm. Well, it says in the LaRousse Encyclopedia of the Earth, it might be supposed that the high temperatures of the lava would give off an enormous amount of heat. This is not so, however, and it is quite usual for a flow to pass through a town or a forest without causing a fire. One flow from Paracutan even piled up against oaks and cottonwoods without destroying them. Wow. How can we explain this anomaly of high lava temperatures and absence of fire and flames? To begin with, lava consists of a vitreous mass, which is a poor conductor of heat. It also cools quickly at the surface, becoming covered with a crust, which in some measure prevents further heat radiation from inside the mass. Thus, a lava flow has, as it were, a constantly forming insulating case around its molten interior so that the front of the flow is preceded by a protecting crust. Mm -hmm. So, this led to the, the arc being completely sealed and encapsulated, cut off from oxygen. And what happens to lava is as it, time goes on, and we see this in Hawaii, you can easily see it there, the lava begins to deteriorate into dirt and soil. Mm -hmm. But this happens very slowly. And so here we have a ship, it's at an angle on the mountain, right. and in the wintertime, as the snow and the rains wash down the mountainside, as the, as the soil deteriorates, mineralized water begins to flow over the wooden timbers. Wood molecules begin to wash away. The flowing water washes these molecules away and others begin to lodge in the little holes that are left behind. This is on a microscopic molecular level. Mm -hmm. Now, other molecules from up above wash in and fill those holes. This is the petrification process. It does take a while, but this is what happened very slowly. The ship's structures would literally be turned to stone as its molecules were replaced one at a time wow. by molecules from the minerals in the region above. Mm -hmm. But the 1960 expedition blew holes into the object with dynamite and found no petrified wood, or at least none that they recognized. They had not taken into account the fact that due to the weather extremes of the region, any petrified structure near the surface would have suffered from the effect of something called frost wedging. Now, the Encyclopedia Britannica says when moisture seeps into the pores of a rock and freezes, it may shatter the rock into tiny fragments of silt or sand size. As this process is repeated year after year, any structure near the surface which would have been exposed to the freezing temperatures would be expected to be fragmented and in time reduced to fragments some the size of a grain of sand. That's where our sand came from. Mm -hmm. And so as we look at this right here, Ron believed the earthquake of 1978 had caused the soil around the boat-shaped object to fall away, leaving the sides exposed. And he believed he was looking at fossilized rib timbers that were greatly damaged. It was unlikely that any petrified structure near the surface would have remained intact due to the weather extremes of the region. At the most, these structures would have suffered enough weathering to give them the jagged appearance of old rocks. If any intact structure remained, it would most likely be found within the soil deep enough to be protected from the elements. Mm. Ultimately, when the petrified structure becomes exposed to the surface, it literally crumbles. And 
So that is what is happening on the sides of the ship right now. Mm -hmm. As you can see now, that looks like ribs, but mm -hmm. what it is, is it's the, the holes are where the ribs are eroding away. Mm -hmm. They're fragmenting due to frost wedging, leaving holes where they were fragmented into literal gravel. Mm -hmm. Ron's greatest hope was that there would be intact petrified structure still encased. Mm -hmm. This is just another picture showing the side. With this understanding of the state of the internal remains being petrified, and, and that had to be understood, Ron and Dr. Baumgardner completed a detailed metal detector scan on the entire site. Wow. They placed rocks on each reading and connected each reading with tapes. They discovered that the section that was impaled by the rock outcropping showed a pattern exactly as would be expected from such an event as a ship crashing into the rock, then aligning itself with the lava floor. And mm -hmm. this was exciting. This was exciting because it definitely proved what happened here. The excitement among the men was palpable. So uh, after they had done uh, that, Ron asked Dr. Baumgartner what he thought about the site and after their examination and testing. Well, John, as a scientist, uh, uh, might I take the liberty here to ask you, uh, do you really honestly believe uh, that you have been on the remains of Noah's Ark? I have no, no doubt in my mind there's, uh, this has to be a man-made structure. It's full of metal. The metal is, uh, has a regular pattern to it. And uh, uh, the size of the thing and the shape of the thing is uh, such that it's, it's almost certainly a, a large boat. After that, ABC's News Magazine 2020 learned of the exciting news and sent their team to Turkey in August of 1985, which was the time of the annual gathering of all the traditional Ararat ark hunters, where they would go climb the mountain and get together and do all of their stuff. Right. So I'm just going to show the portion um, about this site. The boat-shaped site was first found and photographed by a Turkish army captain back in 1959. It was quickly explored and dismissed as a freak of nature. But Wyatt, an amateur archaeologist, rekindled interest in it a few years ago. He brought in Dave Fassel, a marine salvage expert, to assess it. The Doomsday Mountain team brought in some high technology to explore the oldest legend of man. They began scanning their site with a molecular frequency generator. It's a device used by surgeons to pinpoint cancer tumors, and it's been used by Fassel to locate underwater treasure. This time, the molecular frequency generator began to pick up a unique pattern of iron lines beneath the earth. Okay, bring that one up. They began placing ribbons along those lines. The finished shape outlined by the ribbons was that of a huge ship, the approximate length and width of Noah's Ark, as described in the Bible. The fascinating field of ribbons soon attracted higher academic interest. That looks like iron. Okay. Dr. John Baumgartner, a physicist with Los Alamos Laboratories, sent samples back to the lab for analysis and confirmed that the metal they were tracing with the ribbons was indeed iron. With the width and the length known, the only remaining question was depth. By locating the depth of the hull, they could determine if the boat-shaped object had the cargo capacity described in the biblical ark. To resolve this final issue, Wyatt and Fassel brought geologist Tom Finner to Turkey with his company's heavy-duty subsurface radar equipment. Gear like this located the black box cockpit recorder on the floor of the frozen Potomac River after the Air Florida crash. It was here, several miles short of the boat-shaped site, that a waiting game began for Finner and the others. The party needed a final go-ahead from the Turkish government to complete their probe of Doomsday Mountain. The restrictions of martial law left the American explorers isolated from the outside world, not even a telephone. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to hang in 
like smell on a skunk. So there's nothing left. Get this done. Hanging like the smell in the sky. Turkish government stopped the, the exploration. What now? Since we were there, Barbara, things have cooled down, and they've sent their own team of scientists in to take a look at this site. It's a very fascinating location. Wow. So that was very exciting. And like I said, things began to happen rapidly. While Turkish scientists and archaeologists did their own research, Ron and his associates continued their work. The next step was subsurface interface radar. There's a longitudinal bulkhead. You ought to see them pop it up, Ron. Yeah, there they are. There's yeah. another one. There's the key line right there. Yeah. Oh, Ron, the lines are there! <laughs> the lines are there! Okay, we're gonna walk over. Yeah. Take a look. Leave it, leave it running, so everybody knows that we're not cheating here, right? <laughs> you got it. Cole. Okay. Now, this is the west, the west bulkhead. Okay. Can you look through there and? All right. This is the west bulkhead. All right. That was over there, and he walked easterly. Here we start getting the longitudinal bulkheads. Here, 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 here. here okay. Here. You see there how it shows up? All right. The initial scans were very impressive, showing internal structure consistent with bulkheads and rooms. But to be sure they were interpreting the data correctly, Ron took the scan printouts to Geophysical Survey Systems, the developer and manufacturer of the radar. This data is not, it does not represent natural geology. It's, it's a man-made structure. These Reflections are occurring very per periodic, too periodic to be random nat natural type interface. There was no longer any doubt that this was the remains of something man-made. In late 1986, the Turks announced their decision. The ceremony was set for June 1987. During that ceremony, the governor asked Ron to demonstrate the radar on site for the journalists and military officials. When Ron showed them a readout that he said looked like an intact timber, the governor then instructed a soldier to dig right there. What emerged was this petrified section of fossilized, hand-wrought timber. Sectioning showed it to be laminated wood, five layers of timber glued together with pitch, clearly visible oozing from the end. Well, that's incredible. like I said, I told you it would happen very quickly, and it did. I mean, the evidence was there. Right. Ron, uh, the governor, told Ron, you take, that, you take that home with you because if it stays here, it'll disappear. Oh. And um, so Ron took the deck timber for testing at Galbraith Labs in Knoxville, Tennessee. Right. And he was extremely pleased with the result. To determine if it had been once living matter, even though it was fossilized, such as wood, they had to determine if it contained organic carbon. And so um, total carbon was 7.1% percent or 0.71 percent and inorganic was 0.0081 wow. and so that meant subtracting the inorganic from the total yeah. the specimen contained 0.7019 organic carbon wow. and this meant that the specimen contained some material that had once been living matter such as wood this is incredible it's almost and since it looked curious. yeah it since it looked like uh, fossilized wood yeah. This was the confirmation that Ron was looking for. Yeah. In addition, the analysis showed the specimen to be composed of 13.0% iron. Wow. And this accounted for its heavy weight. Again, this was another confirmation to Ron that this specimen had been fossilized by waters which contained dissolved iron. 
that the water picked up as it flowed over the iron fittings used in the construction of the ship because this was found near the low end, almost to the very end. So it had passed over 500 feet almost of structure before it got there. And this is something that I find interesting. One of the more curious features is a squarish hole of metal that's in the, in the deck timber. It's about 1 16th of an inch square, and we do not know if it extends completely through the specimen or not, nor have we tested it. Mm -hmm. Yet Ron's theory was that small nails may have been nailed into the wood when the wood layers were glued together or laminated to hold them in place as the adhesive material, the pitch, the bitumen material dry. Think of it as similar to icing a cake. Your grandmother may have inserted toothpicks right. to prevent the top layer from slipping off. Wow. So, and there's another one. There's two of them that we found, but we, um, that's the only one that I could find <laughs> right now. Yeah, that is incredible. It makes sense. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. And so uh, the radar, and the metal detector readings coincided. As you can see here, um, the metal readings up at the top uh, from the metal detectors and then down at the bottom, the radar, they fit together. Mm -hmm. There was no, uh, no clashing of data. Yeah. Now, a businessman who learned about Ron's work purchased a radar for Ron to use Wow. And so Ron spent 1987 completely scanning the entire arc. Now, remember the 120 by 40 foot section of petrified wood Ron found at the top of the mountain right. in the crescent shape up there? Mm -hmm. Well, the radar showed the ship was missing that section. Oh, wow. And this confirmed to Ron that the bottom of the ship had been ripped away. Wow. It makes sense. Now we're going to go, this is what all has happened after the um, dedication and acceptance by the Turkish government that it is Noah's Ark. Mm. In 1988, on my first trip to the Ark site, mm. Ron told all of us present to be looking for large pieces of strange looking rock falling out from the lower end. Mm. Well, Dr. Meyer, who was with us, picked up this large mass and asked, is this what you're looking for? And Ron, Ron was so low keyed, you know, he, he was very calm about everything, but I could tell he was kind of excited. Oh. And he took that and looked at it and he said, yep. Oh, I love it. <laughs> and so he explained to us that he believed the, the lower part of the hull was full of ballast. Every ship has to have ballast to hold it upright in the water. Right. But Ron believed that the ballast used in Noah's Ark was not just ordinary rocks. Hmm. If you look at this, you can see the top side, it, it looks kind of clumpy. Right. But the underneath side, it looks like it was laid on something and kind of formed. Right. Well, a man we've had a lot of people come to our home and look at these things and a gentleman who worked for Reynolds aluminum came to our home and examined it and he said it looked just like slag or the tailings of metal production mm. and he said he he saw it all the time mm. so that also explained the uh specimen that Ron originally gave to Dr. Baumgartner that he had tested that was also, um, you know, slag material. Mm -hmm. And all of this just proved that Noah had a ready supply of metal after he landed in the new world, so mm -hmm. to speak. Yeah. Very. Now, even though Turkey recognized the site officially as Noah's Ark, Ron believed more work needed to be done. So in 1990, he wanted to do something that would let people see the remains better. He, Richard Reeves, and his faithful driver, De Lavar, 
performed what Ron called a mini excavation. They went into town, bought shovels, added longer handles to them, and bent the shovel head over like a razor, like, you know, like a razor, and it kind of sharpened it, and they proceeded to shave off a very minute amount of material, smoothing it. And the color difference of the ribs became visible. Yeah. This was something that people could easily see and understand without understanding all about petrification and everything. They could here's something they could look at and see. This is not just a, a usual, you know, uh, rock or a bunch of dirt. Right. Now, in his year studying the site, Ron had found evidence that he believed were metal fittings, and he found these in large groups. As you can see here, though, anybody else looking at this, they're, they're going to look at it and not think anything. And as I said last time, I think God gave Ron a gift. I do, of, too. absolutely. Yeah, being able to see things. Mm -hmm. And he believed these were the fittings on the ship. And um, they were in groups of 12, nine large groups. Here's one that's on the, the top surface where it has uh, oxidized. So wow. in 1991, we had a tour group. We had, oh, I don't know how many people, a lot of people with us. Yeah. And Ron saw something on the ground. He bent down, picked it up, handed it to DeLavar, who put it in his pocket. And um, it turned out to look exactly like a, the top part of a rivet. Yeah. And here you can see, um, you can see the lip of the washer. Yeah. And you can see that the top of it looks very much like it was struck while it was hot, which is how a rivet is done. You put the, the rivet through, then put a washer on, and then splay out the top. Right. And the testing of this showed that, um, well, before we get to that, this is, Ron wanted me to make these diagrams to show how they were, it would have looked. But the analysis of these showed that they contain aluminum, titanium, iron, and manganese. All of this uh, would have made the made it very waterproof, mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially titanium and mm -hmm. aluminum. And so once again, uh, you know, we, we have not known how to alloy these materials until the, the early part of the 20th century. Wow. And this is pretty amazing. Um, this is, this is God instructed. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so after Ron had done all his radar scans, he built a model based on his radar scans. Wow. And there's a lot of damage to the ship. So he assumed symmetry mm -hmm. and a, built a destroyed section to match an intact section opposite. But, um, it, you know, it, it, he just did the best he could, but it's, we'll find out later that it's pretty close. Right. Wow. Now, do you remember the anchor stones we talked about earlier? Yes. Or, or drogue stones? Mm -hmm. Well, Ron found a fossilized section on the midsection of the eastern side of the ship. Okay. And uh, you can see that rock. He's pointing to it. Mm -hmm. And here's another picture of it. And you can see it's near the top of the edge where Ron believed was the rail of the ship. Right. Here's a close-up of it, and it here's a better close-up of it. And what Ron believed this was, was where a large configuration of rope was placed to attach a drogue stone. Yeah. Now, these drogue stones, if, as we look at the ship, these had a very vital purpose. Ron talked about how when he did that little ship maneuver, you know, the, where he built the little bitty ship, 
he yeah. said that he saw this thing just swirling around like this right. and it would need something for stability and so this was a huge ship it was in the greatest storm ever right. on the face of this one right none like it none mm -hmm. and so these held the nose into the wave and counterbalanced each side wow. to keep it for roll That is amazing. Okay. We actually uh, took it to the boys club in Nashville and, and put anchors on it. And we got footage of, of that. It was, that was pretty fun. But now the map tells the story because A on the map mm -hmm. is the furthest uh, drugstone that Ron found. And it's about five miles away from the village of A. Okay. Now, B and C are the next two trope stones, and they are actually on two hills. Uh, let me see if I can get in the picture. There's a hill here and a hill here, and the ship went in between here and dropped an anchor on this hill and on this hill. Wow. And they're still on those hills. Huh. So the ark came in from A, where it dropped its first one, right. B and C, they got tangled or got caught, they cut them. Then D is the village of A, that we, where he first went, where all the anchor stones, there's a mass of them. Yeah. Then it followed along the valley until it turned, you can see where it turned and came up right. to where it originally landed. Wow. And so the the crescent shape, you can actually, I've got the E on top of the map, but it actually, you can kind of see the crescent shape in there. Yeah. Wow. So the evidence is there. There's a massive amount. I mean, we just covered the major points. But the next thing, would there be any more evidence? Ron tried three times to excavate and each time catastrophic events prevented it. Oh, okay. The last attempt resulted in their being kidnapped for 21 days by terrorists. Oh Lord. Yeah. So God just didn't want it done. Okay. But then along came John Larson of New Zealand. Okay. He had purchased resistivity equipment, especially for use on Noah's Ark years earlier, but after Ronnie passed away, Finally, he got a permit to use it. Now, this is kind of a long segment, but I think that you want your viewers to see it. We want all truth, yeah. Um, okay, we're, we're on Noah's Ark, and we just finished the last of the scans. Uh, we just finished three cross scans today, which one right in front of us and the other two further down. And we finished 10 longitudinal scans uh, in the last week. And uh, we're getting some good results. It was a couple of years later before John had the software to render the images in 3D. And what the 3D images showed was consistent with that of a ship that had suffered a great deal of damage. After all, if it is Noah's Ark, as we all believe, it is the oldest man-made object on Earth and is impaled on a massive outcrop of rock. The scans clearly showed that this was not a natural object and it looked like a massive shipwreck. As the scans are viewed, each separate color indicates a different electrical resistance of material beneath the ground. The software gives John the ability to filter out certain resistances to focus on similar substances such as eliminating mud versus denser materials. The portion above ground is only the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. This scan shows the complete length of the arc from the right side, that nearest the visitor's center. The line shows ground level and the extent of the remains below the surface. The rock outcrop is visible in this photo. This is what the ship impaled upon and what held it in place as it slid down the mountainside in a lava flow. The effects of the collision were vividly evident back in 1985 
when Ron and his associates did metal detector scans and connected the pattern of readings with tapes. The first thing John wanted to see was the extent of the rock impaling the ship. From simple observation, it looks as if it extended to the middle of the ship, to the center line. But the scans revealed that the rock outcrop itself penetrates to within eight meters of the center line of the vessel. A top section of this rock had broken off and fallen over to the top surface of the ship, making it appear that the total rock mass is actually much larger and that it cuts into the ship further than it actually does. The scans show that the hull is abruptly cut where the rock intersects with it, and this is consistent with the damage which would be expected if a wooden hulled ship struck a rock and became impaled upon it. The damage has distorted the right side and caused the hull to bulge outward as it is seen today. This makes the present shape of this ship appear to be wider than it really is. Scans show that the top part of the hull on the right side has broken completely away and separated from the main section of the ship and tipped outwards. The intact section of the hull, which includes the left side and the center of the vessel, is seen to be considerably more resistive than the separated section on the right side. This would be expected because in a wooden ship, the amount of damage which the right side has sustained would almost certainly have cracked the hull structure in that area, making it more permeable to water and increasing its conductivity. Here, the right side of the hull shape is shown repositioned and moved back into its original shape where it again joins onto the main hull section and is symmetrical to the left side. The packing together of the resistivity contour lines at the boundary between the hull shape and the surrounding material indicates that a sudden change in material properties takes place at this boundary. The material inside the hull shape has a different electrical resistivity compared to the material outside the hull outline, and both of these areas are markedly different from the electrical properties of rock. Looking at the hull shape in three dimensions, the resistivity images show that the front section, which lies beneath the ground, resembles the form of a ship which is streamlined and with the shape of a deep hull design. The resistivity values of the material forming the hull are also the same above the ground as they are beneath. This indicates that the same material makes up the entire hull shape and that this material is relatively impermeable to water. It is a hard substance which has retained its shape. Around the edge of the site are features which Ron believed to be the ribs of the ship. The scans revealed even more encouraging evidence than we could have ever asked for. They showed that the material forming these ribs continued below the ground surface and curved underneath the vessel just as a rib timber would be expected. The electrical resistivity of the material forming the rib was more resistive than the surrounding mud, and the level of resistivity did not appear to change with depth. This consistency indicated that the composition of the material forming the rib had not been unevenly saturated with water or decomposed. Instead, the material appears to be still holding its own structure and is relatively impermeable to water. Ron Wyatt used to point on the inner side of the ship's hull to a series of equally spaced protrusions which are projected at 90 degrees from the outer edge of the hull towards the inside of the ship. He believed these were deck joists which once held a floor or ceiling of some type. The scans revealed that these protrusions were of the same resistivity as the apparent rib material. 
They also revealed that they extended back into the hull and connected directly to the adjacent rib, exactly as Ron believed. Scans show that within the hull shape, there are three distinct flat surfaces of material which extend across the width of the inside of the hull shape. The uppermost surface is seen as a layer of material with a thickness of approximately 3.2 meters, which equals 6 cubits in the exact ancient measurement system. The middle layer measures 4.7 meters in thickness. The height of the lowest deck from the floor to the ceiling measures 7.8 meters, which is exactly 15 ancient cubits. Along the exact center line of the ship, the scans identified an area of much higher resistivity, which is possibly an open cavity. The bottom edge of this cavity is inclined on a 35 degree angle relative to the decks of the ship and slopes downward like a central stairway where it connects the upper, middle, and bottom decks. Halfway down this stairway, at the same level as the floor of the middle deck, the angle of this stairway area flattens out to the same orientation as the middle deck forming what appears to be a horizontal landing. The angle of the stairway-shaped area's floor then resumes and descends down towards the floor of the bottom deck. Another area which shows an equally high level of resistivity is positioned on the middle deck and directly next to the central stairway-shaped area which it joins onto. The bottom edge of this area is situated at the same elevation as what has been assumed to be the stairs landing on the middle deck. This area is square shaped and measures approximately 4 meters in height and a width of 5 meters. It is shaped like a corridor and is oriented at 90 degrees to the stairway shape so that it connects what appears to be the stairway central landing on the middle deck with the outside edge of the left side of the hull. The corridor shape is the only place which penetrates through the side of the hull. Its position in the center of the vessel and leading directly to the central stairway of the ship on the middle deck agrees with the biblical description of a door of the ark. One interesting feature which shows the difference between solid material that is one entire piece versus areas where solid material has been fragmented can be seen in the location of the 1960 dynamite blast. This shows the location of the blast performed on the left side of the ship. The dynamite damage is visible because the material around the dynamite hole has fractured with the blast and is absorbing more water than the surrounding material. This makes the area around the dynamite hole more conductive and shows up on the scans as the red color. These scans conclusively show that this site is not a rock upthrust. It appears to be an object that displays every evidence of being man-made. When the resistivity images were compared to the results of the radar scans performed by Ron Wyatt, it was found that the positions of these structures were in exactly the same locations within the ship. This picture shows the results of the resistivity images which identify these wall structures superimposed upon the results of the radar scans performed by Ron. Wow. 
It's a lot. I know that was kind of a, a technical, <clears throat> but I asked Ron, I asked John, who did the scans in my present husband, Randall helped him. He was his, mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he did all the, um, whatever John asked him to do. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was like he had done all this. He had, he had sold his house that he built in New Zealand and bought this radar. Right. I mean, this um, resistivity equipment is very expensive. Right. And he built another house, you know, he's, <laughs> uh, but he really wanted to do this. And I did not want to make any mistakes. Yeah. So when I put the video together, I tried to um, state things exactly as he had stated them. Mm -hmm. And I apologize if it's kind of hard to understand because he's, he's a very intelligent man, a very godly man too. Yeah. And um, so I, I didn't want to make any mistakes. No, so it's excellent. Yeah. yeah. It, it proves one, it proves exactly what Ron thought as inspired by God, which improves that the word of God is truth. You know, this is Amen. just, you know, and it, and God was so technical in how it was to be built. It just yes. blows me away. Listening to it, because he did this with the Ark of the Covenant. He did this with the show of bread. He did, everything had to be built specific, the tabernacle. Why, yes. you know, he wasn't any different when he first started it with the Ark, you know, so. I know. So hopefully everybody can understand those technical things that are being shown. But to me, I, I got goosebumps watching it just, you know. Oh, yeah. I got goosebumps being there. Yeah. And an interesting thing, um, I'm sure that all of your viewers uh, know the reality of Satan and his evil angels. Mm -hmm. And when we were doing the work on that site, uh, doing the right uh, the resistivity this involved um how long he had 550 foot long cables wow that had to be they hammered in um these things that had um i don't even know the technology but it was very complicated very difficult very involved and we had a storm come up one night, like nothing I've ever seen in my life, wow. ever, ever. And the wind was blowing, it. we couldn't see anything. It was pouring down rain. And it's very hard to get to the ark site anyhow. It's very hard to climb. Right. And um, I, I mean, I remember thinking, oh my goodness, Satan does not want this done. Right. He didn't. Mm -hmm. And so we had to haul all that stuff back to the hotel and they got so mad at us because we made such a mess. Oh, wow. You know, but we cleaned it up. We cleaned our mess up. Yeah. And um it was it, it, then one day they um I wish Randall was here to tell you because one day they got a, a call um uh, saying that there was somebody gonna try to kill them. Because at this time, there was some people out there who were claiming that there was, that they had found Noah's Ark on a, on the mountain and they made up a big story about it and they were, uh, it, it was Chinese, I'll just tell you who it was. Mm -hmm. And it was a made up story and they had, um, going, going to the site, they had all of this um, wood and concrete and everything on the side of the road where they were building hotels and everything mm -hmm. they were trying to make money right mm -hmm. and uh, someone called and said if we didn't leave they were gonna you know kill kill them right and people came to the uh they had to put these stakes in they had to get readings from uh gps and put the stakes in so that john could make sure all of his readings were accurate Wow. And they came down there and tore all the stakes up, except for one, they missed one. And that made it possible to continue the work. Wow. And um, so when it all happened, it was very exciting. It was yeah. very, very exciting because this 
showed, I wish Ron had been able to see this because he thought that all of the remains were clumped down. And it turns out that really they're not, yeah. that the top is crashed. Right. But the rest is under the ground. Isn't that amazing? Oh, yeah. wow. And, and this is the greatest discovery yeah. in the history of the world. Yeah. When you think about it, this is the oldest object. Yeah. And Ron didn't discover it, but Ron believed what it was, and he was persistent. Right. To other men, to other researchers, they both fell away. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, other people saw it, but they didn't call it what it was. And, they, and God was really inspiring Ron. Yeah. And, and like you said, it was over years, you know, and, and it was over turmoil at times, like you're, yeah. you're saying. And people, um, sometimes they'll say, oh, you, you're an overnight success. And you'll, and you'll hear people say, yeah, it took me 20 years, 30 years, right. you know, and that's the same thing with this. You know, this wasn't just, oh, he walked up, he saw it and he goes, oh, that's Noah's Ark. And then it was over. I mean, as it was so did, much. And yeah. we didn't cover everything. Right. It, it, there's just so much. Right. But um, I think, how can anybody deny what this is? Right. God has provided the proof. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's, it's proven with the scripture, like you were saying. Like uh, people need to understand the actual, um, you know, sizes and cubics. And, you know, it's all, we, we use inches and all that stuff. So some yes. people are like, what is all that? But the, the fact is, it, it does correlate with the Bible perfectly. Right. Yeah, it um, does. And it verifies that the word of God is true. And that there was a man named Noah, and they lived in a town of eight, <laughs> you know, and they landed there. And it just is so amazing. It just makes me so excited. And you've got to give it to Ron for, like he said, you know, we're going to stay here like a stink on a skunk or whatever. Yeah, that's what he said. <laughs> that persistence is what has helped drive him to find this and other things. And that was something I was thinking while you were um, running this. I have always thought how, you know, the Bible's true. So why hasn't anybody just gone and find found this stuff? Yes. And Ron right. had been led to do that. And you know, he was arrested. He that we'll get into all that and the other stories yeah. he went through a lot a lot him and his sons both you know um and that'll come up in the future episodes yeah. but it, this was a man driven by the spirit of god and now you know we're going to begin to see these truths come out in greater and greater and i know i was led of the lord uh, the lord began you know begin giving me new revelation and as I started getting into that revelation, I was driven to start studying the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant and all this. And then that led me to um, to you and a, another gentleman who likes to talk about the Ark, Kevin Fisher. And the, and the Lord's like, you know, get in touch with them, have them on your show. And I went, they won't want to come on my show. <laughs> and the Lord's like, just, in other words, do what I tell oh, you, <laughs> you know. Right. And, and uh, so I wrote and, and I'm so grateful to God that he has allowed you to bring these truths and I'm just praying for the Lord to bring this far and wide because people need to know that the word of God is real that God is an organized loving God who mm -hmm. has he, and even in the craziest of times he's always been there for man he's always made a way of escape for the righteous yeah. and even in the time we're in right now we need to remember that you know right. He always makes a way of escape for the righteous, even if there were only eight back mm -hmm. in the days of Noah. <laughs> right. He made a way, and uh, this is just proof of it. It's so exciting. One of the things that Ron would say, people would say, well, I don't need this. I have faith. I don't need this. And he said, um, one of these days, what if, someone is got an AK-47 pointed at you, you know, well, he had, he did ended up having that experience in Turkey. Wow. And someone pointed a gun at him. The police were surrounding them. The army was surrounding them and the kidnappers were telling them, 
tell them to go away, tell them to go away. And they had a gun on every one of the people. And Ron said he looked at the boy who was pointing the gun at him and he had a little tear in his eye. And he said, when I saw that boy had a tear in his eye, I figured we were gone, you know, because he knew that if he shot us, he would be killed too. Mm -hmm. And Ron said he said a prayer. And what came back to him was, be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Wow. And he said, that really wasn't what I wanted to hear right then. <laughs> he right. said it was comforting, but I wanted to hear <laughs> <I can't. laughs> That is funny. It's like, I know. bitter in the word for me right now. <laughs> but he says, you know, we're going to have to have a faith where yeah. we can stand up to that. Yeah. That, it, it, you know, and if we just have a flip floppy, you know, I'll, I'll go with the, I'll go with the flow. I'll go with them. Whatever right. they say, I'm, I'm good. You know, yeah. uh, uh right. God, like you were saying earlier, you said God was very particular in the way these things were built. Yeah. He's very particular about the way we worship and the way that we, we react to him. Yes. And, yeah. and we have to know what he says tells us to do because there's a reason he's yeah. not just lording it over us and saying i'm god and i say so right there are reasons and we'll 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 learn all that together yeah amen and there is a scripture that, that says in um, revelation 12 11 you know they overcome by the word of their testimony you know and yes. uh, by the blood of the lamb by the word of their testimony mm -hmm. and they care not for their lives it's just a um, that's not for yes. him, but it's in you know, interpretation. And so Ron, Ron experienced that, you know, right there. Okay. I'm going to stand on the truth. I'm going to trust the Lord and whew. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and that, that wasn't the first time they've had. No. What I, I, cause there were other times with, even with his sons where he said, don't answer. I, we'll get yes. that in other. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, so that was in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. we're going to see a couple of things here. We're learning that the word of God is true, but we're also learning what it, what it looks like for a, a man who's not perfect, who's not an archaeologist, you know, or archaeologist, you know, he's not in that field. He's, he is a man driven by the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. And being driven, he's just obedient. He doesn't even know in the last episode why they're putting rocks where they were putting rocks in the car kept stalling. If you haven't seen that, that's in the first uh, episode of this um, here. Uh, you know, but he's he's a natural, normal man being led by God. And we're seeing, you know, he had to fight in his faith for what he believed. And, uh, and yet, because of it, we have proof here that Noah's Ark is real that the word of god is true and that a man can stand on what god promises and it will be fulfilled and even though ron is now with the lord his work has is is going forward and uh and the lord is blessing and using you to bring this forward and um i'm just so grateful to be part of it and just to because it excites me i love the lord so much and and it is that all in you know to see the glory of the lord so oh, i can't thank you enough i can't thank you enough for sharing this and so now the next time we're going to be bringing i think uh which did you want to bring i don't know what do you what yeah. do you want to, we've still got um we've got sodom and gomorrah we've got the red sea crossing yeah. and mount sinai right. and then we've got um there's a few other things, but I think we'll just, and then the Ark of the Covenant. Right, you will end up, uh, yeah. Do you want to do them in the order that he found them or in the order chronologically in history? Like uh, this was the first thing. Yeah, what do you think is the best way to present it? Um, maybe, because, maybe we should... Um, Let's do Sodom and Gomorrah next. Next, okay. Because in the 
time in the timeline of history. Okay, that would have been the next thing. Okay. Another one that I would really like to present if we have time, I mean, if you would like it. Oh, I want is, everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's Joseph. Okay. The yeah. All of Joseph. That that was one of Ron's all time favorites. Oh wow. Okay. And, um, yeah, but, that's exciting. Yeah. So Sodom and Gomorrah, Joseph. I even want to eventually um, have you share the book. You know, I have it down. I'd love to. Yeah. I, I have one over there by my my bed oh it's okay you can it's cut okay. that out but uh, but um uh i have a you know the copy and it's so good people so we can do that and then you know whichever whichever you want so we'll go with um next we'll do sodom and gomorrah okay because it, it's so exciting you don't it, there's so much substance here you don't even know what you want you know like i want to eat it all right now <laughs> i know so did i i know yeah. see i'm i'm just like everybody else hearing this for the first time yeah there was a day when i heard it all for the first time and it changed my life yeah yeah Ron walked into my office and um because a man had asked him to come because he and i had started talking about archaeology right and he stood and talked to us just a handful of us listened yeah. and it changed my life because right. it was the first time i'd ever heard anybody talk about Jesus as a real person. Right, right. And now here I am all these years later, yeah. still being able to share it with others and I can still feel that same excitement and I want other people to feel that as well. Yeah, amen. And even if it's one that, that right. sees this and, and changes their life forever, the, you know, what comes from that Yes, we have no idea, and we so we just leave this before the Lord, and uh, yeah, and let Him lead it, and let Him guide it, and bring it where He wants it. It's, so I'm so excited. So we will come back, and we'll do Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, and I look forward to that as well. And I want to thank you again for coming on and sharing all of this. So this is part two. Noah's Ark is the wrap up of Noah's Ark, and uh, and we'll we'll just keep moving, following the Lord. So thank you. Thank you so much. God See bless you next week. Yeah. Next time. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.